Welcome to People Who Perform, the Real Estate Careers Podcast. Each episode will bring you conversations from business leaders and up and coming stars in the commercial real estate industry in Canada. Our guests will share their unique career journeys, passions, and advice on what it takes to be successful in this industry. This podcast is brought to you by Highview Partners, connecting people who perform in Canadian real estate. I am your host, James Ashley, and today I have the pleasure of connecting you with Elena Boyack. Elena's working career has been focused on talent acquisition in the commercial real estate industry for over a decade. She started her career working for a recruiting agency in Toronto that specialized in real estate hires. She then moved in-house with Great West Life, and for the last eight years, she's worked for a trio of realty advisors, spearheading their efforts to attract the best talent in the market. Elena has an insatiable appetite for service excellence, and as a result, she has successfully placed hundreds upon hundreds of real estate professionals across Canada. Elena, a very warm welcome to the People Who Perform podcast. It's so great to have you here with us today. I'm so excited to have this conversation and for our listeners to learn about your career journey, your passions, your knowledge, and your advice both to real estate, but also talent acquisition. So thank you so much for being with us. Excellent. Thank you, James, for having me. It's a pleasure to be on here with you. So thank you. My first question, Elena, is how did you get started in the real estate industry and also talent acquisition? After high school, I I knew uh, whatever I wanted to do, it had to be around people. So um, I actually initially pursued um, social work. So I graduated with a diploma in social work. And once I had that, I thought, you know what, it might be uh, useful to get a university degree. So I went to Western, got a degree in psychology. And then I thought, you know, now that I have my university degree, I, I don't really yet have a direction in terms of which route I want to take. And from speaking to a few people, you know, HR came up and I looked into the career of HR and I decided to pursue that. So I got my diploma in HR. And uh, once I graduated from that, you know, downtown Toronto, it was hard uh, to step into a junior HR role just because of the high volume of people that were in similar positions to me. So I actually started off working for a recruitment firm. This recruitment firm did specialize in real estate. So that was in 2008, probably the worst time to start in the recruitment industry. So I started doing that. I was there for about a year and uh, one of my clients was actually um, Great West Life Realty Advisors and they had a job opportunity for a contract staffing professional and I applied for that. I got the job. So I, I actually remember when I was going to that interview and somebody close to me said, you know, Elena, if you get yourself into an organization like that with your work ethic, your career will grow exponentially. And I thought, what do you mean by that? Because I've never worked for a large organization. So I was there for um, close to two years. I did do a good job in terms of um, using our own internal resources to hire our candidates. From GWL Realty Advisors, I moved on to Triavest, and that's where I'm still at today. And when I joined Triavest, they were actually going through an amalgamation, and that's something that I was pretty excited to be a part of. And um, I've been given a lot of runway and have had the opportunity to establish uh, policies, process, structure, which are still in place today. And I've really been given the opportunity to create and explore and um, develop, um, and which is my team is very supportive of. Fantastic, Elena. Thanks so much for sharing. And clearly, you've taken calculated steps to further your education and get yourself on the right path for you and one which sounds like a match with your personality and also your passion for people. And you've maneuvered yourself between both sides of the table. I'm curious to know, what are the contrasts between working in an agency versus an in-house team? How recruiters work um, within an, a firm versus how they work inside a corporation or organization is very different. You know, as you know, James, in a recruitment firm, you have to hustle, right? Just because the compensation structure is different. So if you apply that within an organization, um, your efforts will be your efforts will be noticed. So you very much took the principles of working in an agency. And, and took those in-house. And certainly that, that pace at which we do work 
Um, that ability to spin two plates um, and keep the pedals moving at the same time is very much the nature of being a recruiter. Yes. And that's something that you certainly have brought in-house. Exactly. Let's now talk about the best team that you've ever been a part of. Why was it the best team? That's a tough one because I, I have worked with some great people um, and that I've learned from and keep learning from. So currently I'm working with a pretty diverse team um, that has different backgrounds, different specialties. Whenever we hash out different ideas or different approaches, it's pretty neat to see everyone's different perspective based on their unique backgrounds. So, you know, from that, I've learned the importance of having diversity on a team and within an organization. I know diversity and inclusion is a big hot topic right now, and organizations are trying to meet the numbers when it comes to diversity, but it, it's really not about that. Um, although it is important to meet the numbers, it's really about becoming stronger as a team and organization due to the different thoughts and ideas and practices. The team that I'm currently on um, and the individual that leads it, he's an executive vice president, and he joined Tree of Us around the same time as I did. And he is very much people oriented. And I, I think that that's what leadership is about. And I remember a time when it was a Friday and it was probably around six o'clock and both him and I were still at the office. He called me and said, Elena, I have something for you in the office. So uh, when I went to see him, he had a little piece of paper that said dinner for you and your husband on Tree of Est. And I remember that. And it was I was just so thankful that he could recognize me in such a unique way. That still resonates with me. So that just goes to show the the leadership that we have. Lena, let's now talk about technology. It's been changing at such a fast rate in talent acquisition and recruitment. How have the advancements changed the way that you go about your work? Technology now is used more than ever when it comes to recruiting, especially now as we're being forced to use it. Um, I'm seeing a lot of assessments and AI technology being introduced into recruiting and hiring. And most organizations want to succeed in their hiring practices. And the technology that's out there today is really assisting in that process. Um, at Tree of Us, we've actually started using an assessment tool. So we're still at the point of measuring uh, whether or not it's a useful tool, but um, what we're getting is these assessments of the candidates. So it measures their um, cognitive ability, motivation, and personality. So when we do these assessments before we meet with the candidates, it really gives us a clearer picture of the candidate, and you kind of get a feel for who you're meeting with uh, before you meet with them. And you know, as you know, James, it's important and that we find the right person, but also that the person has found the right role for them. So it really needs to be a win-win for it to be a success. And I, and I found that completing these assessments really assist with that. There's a number of bases that we can cover as recruiters and talent acquisition specialists to ensure that there is a positive ROI uh, for the company when we're going into hiring. And more and more now, I'm seeing that companies are stepping up and doing the pre-employment assessments to ensure that beyond the interviews, beyond, beyond the resume, beyond the references, the criminal and all the other background checks, that we're really getting some insight into that individual's personality, how they think, how they feel, and possibly how they go about uh, performing in their work. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And what I also find great is... Um, when candidates actually ask for their assessments, not, I would say probably 90% of candidates don't even ask um, to receive the results of their assessment, but those that do, we're more than happy to share that assessment with them because it is important for them to also, one, view their results because they're curious how they did on the timed test, but also to see their personality in writing. Yeah. It's a conversation starter, and uh, I think it's a great tool to use uh, during the interview process. Elena, thanks for sharing with us about your career journey. I'd like to now move into the motivation, the drive, and the passion behind who you are and what you do. So my first question is, what drives your best performance at work? I would say my best work happens when my personal life is taken care of. And uh, that's when I can focus 100% of my energy on my work. Uh, it's, it's tough to perform when your health, home, or family is unbalanced. So I think that's why it's so important to partner yourself with an organization that allows you to focus on that and be your best self at work. I certainly didn't uh, see that that way before I had my family, but now I really appreciate it. And uh, during work, I find it helpful to structure and dictate um, how my day will go versus letting the day take over based on the emails and the calls I receive. 
Um, I've had days where at the end I thought, what have I accomplished today? So those are my probably most frustrating days. And those are the days I'm in response mode. I apply that kind of thinking in almost everything I do. I like to set the pace um, and the mood for the day versus letting uh, the wind move me into whichever direction. Some of the most successful recruiters that I've worked with have a very rigid structure mm-hmm. when it comes to planning out their day. Mm-hmm. So the first 30 minute window in the morning is just checking back in with what they've already put in writing the night before for what they need to do. And it's really about measuring out the windows of time, the minutes, the hours, the tasks, breaking it down into high value, low value activity, working on the sprints on the phone, um, working on the follow-up and the feedback. It's being very structured in what we do. Now, when I wor- was working for the recruitment firm, one of my biggest lessons or takeaway there was do the thing that you least like to do first thing in the morning. And at that time, it was making a cold calls to the clients. So, um, you know, that's still how I structure my day is whatever to do I have uh, for the day. I focus first thing in the morning on the tasks that I that I least want to work on. So you mean to say cold calling was was (laughs) not the favorite part of your job in 2008? No. (laughs) In your role, you will be exposed to many layers of the business, and you must have witnessed many different approaches to leadership. Can you share with us an example of where you have seen the impact of a great leader, and how did that benefit the people involved and the organization as a whole? Leadership has to be centered around people, um, and that's your team and the people within your organization. And people are intelligent, and when a leader is leading from their self-interest, Uh, People will catch on to that and lose trust very quickly. And uh, when leaders lead from a people focus, they gain the trust of the organization so that, you know, even in tough decisions or tough times, um, when those are made, people will trust that the leader made it in good faith. Um, James, you've probably seen leadership from our perspective of a flip triangle. Um, that's something that um, three of us discusses when we do the service excellence training. But it's really um, instead of the majority serving the top, it's the top serving the majority. Mm-hmm. And I really believe that if if the peak, uh, the senior leaders serve the bottom, you can produce incredible results. And by serving, what I really mean is ensuring um, there's proper resources provided to the employees, making yourself available for conversations to hash out ideas and recognize when good work has been accomplished. We hear time and time again when recruiting and hiring that word fit. And In your view, why is fit so important? How do you go about deciphering what is the right fit when you're hiring for your business? It really starts off with the organization determining what their core values are and what what is the culture that they want to create. At Tree of Us, we have established four core values that uh, we train our employees on and that we really hire people around. And those core values, um, they stand for TRIO. So T for teamwork, R for results, I for integrity, and O for own it. So when we do hire our uh, future employees, we really hire around those core values and ensure that they understand them um, and can live them out. And actually during the application process, one of the application questions that we ask every candidate is, Have they reviewed and understood our core values? I want to bring us back to technology that we talked about earlier. And I'm curious to know, when you've been going through the hiring process and you're with the hiring managers and you're meeting the candidates, have there been any times when in the interview, you and the hiring manager have said, yes, this is is the right person for us. But then through the assessments that you use, has it either heightened and elevated that belief in fit or has it actually done the contrary and made you realize that perhaps this is not the right fit? We like to complete these assessments before uh, we meet with a candidate. So we kind of already know their preferences, their strengths, how they like to work in the ideal work environment for them. And uh, whichever areas that, you know, there might be a slight gap in, in terms of what we can deliver on and our work environment versus their preference, we really address that in the interview process. So there is no surprises when they come on board. 
during the interview process, I mean, you can ask all the questions mm -hmm. and, and, you know, try to stay attuned to what the candidate is saying to you. And during these assessments, um, it opens our eyes and even sometimes the candidate's eyes in terms of their preference of work, um, whether or not they like a structured environment or they like an environment that has a bit more flexibility. Working with a number of different hiring managers across the industry, I've seen a range of different techniques. And one that caught my eye and my interest was one client, when it comes to fit, likes to stress test a person's ability to remain calm and collective in the face of adversity. Because being in property management, a big part of the business is dealing with problems, putting out fires, dealing with tenant issues. So they, they would ask some very direct questions in terms, and sometimes some very direct opinions, like, I don't think you could do this job, just simply to see how that candidate would act and respond and cope in that situation. So um, whether it's technology or whether it's just within the questioning and the asking, there are many different ways in which we can um, look to explore fit. Another attribute that I like to um, look for in candidates is their excitement about the opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, like I remember when I was a job seeker, I really wanted that job. And I find that when people really want the job, they will perform. And I, I've been in situations where I've had to recalibrate um, in terms of which candidates I will put forward to hiring managers just based on the excitement level of the candidate. When the opportunity at GWL uh, came up, I really wanted that job. I, I did the research in terms of what they did, how they did it, and their leadership team. And I came into that interview prepared. Um, and I remember at the interview, and this is something that when you work for a recruitment firm, you prep your candidates to say at the interview, at the end of the interview, is make sure that you tell the interviewer that you really want the job. And I made sure to make that very clear. And I and that's the same attribute that I look for in candidates is when I interview them and I ask them about, you know, what do they know about TrioVest? And when they've done their homework in terms of what we're doing in regards to sustainability, who we are, uh, who our clients are, who our senior leadership team is, when they've done that homework, that shows me that they want this job. Fortunately, there are so many different ways that we can do our homework on a business these days, whether the obvious go online, go on Google, go on their website, go on LinkedIn, ask around the industry. Like it's so easy now to connect with people to find information of what it's like to work inside of that organization. And as you rightfully pointed out, it's very powerful. It leaves a powerful impact to let that audience know, I want this job. Exactly. Are you ready to make the best next move in the Canadian real estate industry? We know moving to a new job is a career defining decision. So our team will help you recognize and leverage the skills and passion that drive your performance. We want you to make the right choice and feel confident you are joining a team of people who perform. So contact us today or visit us at highviewpartners.ca forward slash candidates. Elena, thanks for talking to us about your passions. And now I would like to get to know you better. And with that, our first question is, who were your role models growing up and what did they teach you that you now apply today? That's a really good question. So James, as you as you know, I grew up in Siberia, Russia, and I moved to Canada in 91 uh, when I was eight years old. So when we came to Canada, we didn't know the language. Um, we came with pretty much no money. So our first day here, my parents went to work on a farm earning $7 an hour and my parents really are my role models. Coming to a foreign country, no money, no language, having to work on a farm, they've worked extremely hard and were able to very quickly um, save up enough money to buy a house. And um, you would think that they would stop once they paid off their debt, but they continue to this day to work hard and strive to be their best. Um, their work ethic really is like no other. My dad always says that if you can speak English, you can do anything you want in Canada. So knowing the sacrifice they made for me and my brother, and leaving everything behind in Russia and to come to a foreign land, I couldn't disappoint them. And I had to make sure that I was successful in whatever I do. And I'm sure your parents are extremely proud of you, but also grateful that you have returned home from Toronto and now you're living in Niagara so they can see you, your husband and the little ones as often uh, as, they, as they like. Thanks for sharing that story with us. So when you're away from the business, 
How do you like to wind down or wind up your day? Um, what do you enjoy about life outside of work? So I do live in Niagara in the Lake, as you mentioned. So it's a different pace than it is uh, downtown. I really have the best of both worlds. Um, a great job downtown Toronto and a quiet country home to rest my head at night. So I'm blessed to be where I am. So James, as as you know, our world today and our jobs can be extremely stressful and demanding. And I'm a big proponent of movement and exercise. Um, I've always been an avid either gym goer or doing yoga at home or going for walks, going for bike rides. Um, and now that I have kids, you know, we we're constantly outside playing in the yard or in the pool. I, I think that's very important um, to be able to unwind yeah, it's very important to strike that balance. And as you mentioned, working in this day and age with the pressure, the stress, the added responsibility, we're expected to do a lot more for a lot less. Um, it can be a huge time constraint and stepping away from that and finding some time to be active, to move, to spend time with our loved ones has a huge impact on our mental and physical state of health and well-being. I also think it's important to not only move your body, but to also give your mind a break. So instead of sitting in front of a TV, you know, picking up a book on, on a topic of something that's new to you. Um, you know, I'm an avid reader. When I when I commute to work, um, I would always um, either listen to an audiobook if I would drive or a book on the train. I think it's important to give your mind that break um, from mm -hmm. your work and do something different. You and I have often shared the latest and greatest book that we're reading and before we even jumped on the podcast today we were talking about I was pulling out the books from the bookcase behind me and we were we were sort of sharing notes and some of the different books that we've both read um what's been a book that you've read recently that has really spoken to you that you've enjoyed I've always enjoyed uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book and his new book Talking to Strangers um very interesting and somewhat eye-opening so that was a great read yeah, it's a fantastic read. I love the way that he goes into how, you know, human beings are very much programmed to um, give people the benefit of the doubt, to believe that people are speaking their truth um, exactly. and, how we, and how we draw to that conclusion. And as a result, what that then can cause. And he goes into detail about, you know, how that can go good and how that can also go painfully wrong in society. Mm -hmm. So, no, he's he's a fantastic and read as well as outliers as one of my all-time favorites as well so good good call on gladwell <laughs> so when you're looking back over your career one day perhaps sitting down on one of those vineyards in niagara on the lake with the family what would you like people to remember elena for so my motto has always been about helping others. It's, it's really why I went into um, social work, then psychology, then HR, and really it's helping others achieve their goals and potential. And if I can be a part of that, then I consider myself successful. Elena, thanks for sharing your story with us today. It's been so great listening to your journey from social work to recruitment to talent acquisition and HR, from Siberia to Toronto to Niagara, and the things that matter to you, the passions that you found along the way, the people that have mattered to you in your life, and the steps that you take to alleviate the stress and strain of work. I'd like to now talk about the advice that you have for others. So for the people that are listening, if somebody is looking to step into talent acquisition and the real estate industry, what would be your advice to those people? I would say become familiar with your strengths, especially when um, when you're first starting out or you're a new graduate from school, you may not necessarily know what you're good at. And there's a ton of great resources out there to do that. So I remember using um, the Strength Finder, which you can purchase online and complete the survey. Um, it actually populates five of your strengths. And I did that, you know, probably five, eight years ago, but my five strengths have stuck out with me. And it's something that I continue to think about um, to this day. So in recruiting, there's a saying, um, James, that you're probably familiar with that goes, you're as good as your last placement. And I think that applies to any one of our roles. Um, and you're as good as your last you know, report or pre presentation or whatever it may be. 
I know that in our generation, we want to continue to grow and progress our careers to the next level or the next pay grade. But my suggestion is to really take your time. It takes time to be exposed to different experiences. And that's something that you can't rush. Um, You don't want to be in a position where you've moved up too quickly and um, the role is now beyond you. So take your time in whatever role you're currently in. I think he highlighted a very important point there, which is learning is key. Take the time to educate yourself. Take the time to learn from the courses, from the people that are around you. You know, find mentors early on. That's been a recurring theme through the podcast. You know, look for that person that can help you elevate and get to where you want to be, even when you're making the first steps in your career. And remind yourself and remember, it's not a race, (laughs) right? Yeah, you're absolutely right, James. It's not a race. So for somebody that's looking to raise their game inside of the industry, they're already working inside of talent acquisition and real estate. What would be your advice to those people? I would say seek feedback from the people you trust. Um, You know, whether it's your team or your manager, we all have areas that we're blind to. And a lot of times, um, you know, your manager may not share that with you unless you ask them and ask them several times. So I I encourage um, you to do that. If your manager or team knows that your intention is to grow and to develop, um, they would definitely be open to giving you that kind of feedback if you take that feedback well. And similar to the last question, um, I would also say put in your time. Don't rush to get to the next level. There are cycles and times that you may need to experience at your current level, uh, which you may not get exposure to in the next role. And if you've put in your time, you've consistently performed, then I would suggest you advocate for yourself. Uh, Don't wait for your manager to bring up the conversation. Um, You do your homework and you come to the table of what you think is the next reasonable project or move or promotion. I would also encourage people to raise their hand, ask to be involved. There are so many opportunities in the industry to get involved in projects, get involved in steering groups and committees. Take that initiative to step up and stand out and learn. One skill that I think that uh, most people may not necessarily think about getting really good at, but that's uh, negotiating. Negotiation is a skill that I think a lot of us um, could get better at, and it's it's something that we use in a lot of um, tasks or areas that we may not think of, whether it's negotiating a deadline or a salary increase or um, your perspective on a project or with your kids. Um, So it's really a key skill. Yeah, negotiation comes in many different shapes and sizes and forms. And it's not only needed when you're an external recruiter working on a hire with Elena and you need to negotiate on a contract. You better make sure your (laughs) skills are very good. Um, But no, jokes aside, it does apply to every aspect of what we do. And I think certainly investing in improving your ability to negotiate, to listen, to solve that problem and ensure by listening and solving the problem that everybody wins. And that really is what negotiation is about. It's a win-win situation for everybody that's involved. Thank you for listening to People Who Perform, the Real Estate Careers podcast brought to you by Highview Partners, a talent search and recruitment firm focused exclusively on Canadian real estate. If your real estate team is looking to find the best next hire, or if you're ready to make the best next move in your career, then reach out to Highview Partners today. Follow us on LinkedIn and visit us at highviewpartners.ca.